as I said, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 6. And I've titled today's message, The Reliability of God's Promises. Now, have any of you, I'm sure all of you, have taken a detour? You know, uh, you've gotten off the highway and, you know, or the signs there that tell you you got to exit and it gives you a detour. you got to maneuver around or two to get back on the highway. Um, you know that many times, once you take that alternate tour, that ultimate route, it can be really difficult to get back onto the main road. Well, back in chapter 5, verse 11, I pointed out that the author of Hebrews, he departs strategically for a bit from the topic of Christ's appointment as, the high, as high priest in order to warn his hearers concerning their spiritual immaturity. In the last part of chapter 5, he offered an assessment of their condition. And in, in the first 12 verses of chapter 6 we looked, that we looked at last week, uh, we covered th three things that he wrote on. The necessity of moving on to spiritual maturity. A warning to believers who separate themselves from the love of God. And an encouragement that, and his encouragement that he expected his readers to persevere to the end and receive blessings. And so now in the passage we're going to be covering today, the author will build on his exhortation that he began in chapter 5, verse 11, and then return his discussion of Christ's supremacy superiority or superior priestly ministry. So you can consider this section here that this last section of chapter six as sort of the 360. He comes back around. The author here comes back around, but he finishes a few thoughts here. Um, it's again, sort of a, an on-ramp that's meant to smoothly transition from the detour that he took in chapters 5, verse 11, through chapter 6, I mean, through verse 12 of chapter 6, and then back on to his original topic regarding Jesus' Melchizedek-like appointment as high priest. Now, while the passage we looked at are meant to assure us that God is faithful to his promises, verses 13 to 20 will confirm the claim of verse 12 which is basically this. Those who persevere in the faith, those who hold on and not give up, those who mature in the faith will inherit the promises God has made in Jesus Christ. And so now let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us before we get into his word. Heavenly Father, um, it's a great morning you've given us. Lord, and we are so thankful that you are a great and amazing and merciful and beautiful and wonderful God. That you're not like the gods of this world. You're not like the gods that were created in the minds of men and by the hands of men. Lord, but you are the God of gods, the King of kings, God of this universe. And it's just again amazing that you love each and every single one of us individually, Lord. You sent your son to, to die for us, even though we weren't worthy. Lord, I thank you again that you've brought us here and I pray for those watching, listening, that you will speak to them, Lord, that you will change lives, Lord, that you will, this message will be heard wherever it needs to be heard and be received wherever it needs to be received. And bless this time, protect this room, Lord, keep us safe. 
Just fill it with your Holy Spirit. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. The Word of God says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself, I will indeed bless you, and I will greatly multiply you. And so, after waiting patiently, Abraham obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and for them a confirming oath ends every dispute. Because God wanted to show his unchangeable purpose even more clearly to the heirs of the promise, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might might have strong encouragement to seize the hope set before us. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure, It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner because he has become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So in order to make sure that the readers didn't misinterpret his exhortation to spiritual maturity, The writer here ended this section with a tremendous argument for the assurance of salvation. And so he gives three arguments here for the certain salvation of true believers. The first argument he makes on this is God's promise in verses 13 through 15. Now, all of us in our lifetime, have given oaths, promises. We've made them in our own way. Um, You know, I'll give you a quick example. Promises in our house are very important. But when you give a pinky promise, that's when it's really, really important. That's when it's really, really serious. And so anytime my wife or Bella or any of my kids have asked me, do you pinky promise? I'm like, no, you know, if not something, if it's something that I'm not sure I'll be able to, to come through with, but I will say, I will try my best. Um, you know, and so there may, maybe you have your own way. You have your own way of, of, of giving and um, receiving promises. But in ancient Israel, Oats were taken, taken much more differently than oats taken today. Back then, oats weren't contractual, and they were sealed, and they weren't sealed with a signature like they are now. Ancient Israelites sealed their oats by their personal word, which was also the way that God made his oath with Abraham. And so in order to really get what's being said here, you must first understand that God is an oath-giving God who seals his oaths with his own word and by his own name. The context of verse 13 points to Genesis chapter 22, verses 16 and 17, where the Lord tells Abraham, by myself I have sworn, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Now the reason God swears by himself is because there's no one greater to swear by, which means that there's a 100% guarantee that everything he promises will be fulfilled. Well, Abraham believed the promise, waited patiently for it, 
and eventually obtained what was promised. And then furthermore, God, when God swore by his own name, he declared to all of creation that he was making this pledge to Abraham and that he would keep it. Now, let me again remind you that when the author wrote this letter, some of the readers were about to give up on the faith. And they were going to go back to the religion of their fathers. And so what he's basically saying here, what the author is basically saying here is, you will obtain and enjoy what God has promised you if you diligently apply yourself to the development of your spiritual life. Now, did you know that if you're a believer here today, this morning, you have more of God's promises than Abraham did? Now, the reason many Christians don't make any spiritual progress is because they don't apply themselves by faith. Now, let me explain, just so there isn't any confusion. Let me explain what I mean with the familiar illustration of a farm that we see here in the Bible and that is often given um, by many teachers and commentators. Uh, the farmer doesn't reap a harvest by sitting on the porch and just looking out in the field and just seeing the seed on the ground. By just looking at it. He must get busy and plow. plow. He must plant, weed, cultivate, and perhaps even water the soil. Well, what do you think happens if the farmer doesn't do any of that? If he's just lazy and doesn't put the work in? So you see what I'm saying? The believer who neglects church fellowship, ignores the Bible, and forgets to pray is not going to reach, is not going to reap much of a harvest. It's important that these, this is part of your, of what you have to do, what you ought to be doing. Spend time in the Word, spend time in fellowship. Spend time reading and just spending time with the Lord. Again, these are things that are important for your growth. If you don't do these, there won't be much of a spiritual harvest. There won't be much fruit. You know, again, let me, remind, let me tell you again that if you're the kind of person that says, there's not much fruit in my life. I want to see more fruit. The Bible says that I'm supposed to be developing more fruit. Well, are you spending time in the Word? Are you studying, reading, time in fell? Are you going to church? And not doing this because, and not going or doing these things because you feel like you, you, feel like you have to, but because, again, you, you want to. It's something that you enjoy doing, that you want to do. It's important to put the work in. You want to reap a harvest. Now, in verses 16 through 18, we're given the second argument for the certain salvation of true believers. God's oath. In these verses, we learn that God not only gave Abraham a promise, but he also confirmed that promise with an oath. You probably know that when a witness takes an oath in court, or maybe you've been in this position where you've gone to court and you've been a witness or you've taken the stand. You are confronted by either the judge or the lawyer with an oath that usually ends, typically ends with, so help me God. Now, the reason this is done is because those who are taking the stand are calling on the greater to witness for the lesser. None, nothing at all is greater than God. And for this reason, God swore by himself. 
But God didn't only do this only for Abraham. He has also given this promise and oath to the heirs of the promise who were Abraham and his, and his descendants. But what does Abraham's promise have to do with the author's audience? For them, the heirs of the promises are those who have been adopted by faith in Christ as sons and daughters of God. As we have already seen in chapter 2, verses 5 through 18, Jesus' brothers and sisters share in Abraham's promises. And again, who are Jesus' brothers and sisters? It's us. Those who are in Christ, believers, born-again believers. He has called us brothers and sisters in Christ. So we share in that promise. In the next verse, verse 18, the author may, mentions two unchangeable things. This is referring to the irrevocable nature of God's purpose and word and the oath that he declared publicly. It's impossible for God to lie in these two unchangeable things. God wouldn't be God if he were a liar. Now here the author reinforces God's unchangeableness in order to encourage the church to once again hold firmly. The church is the refugee who must flee to God for rescue, and who needs strong encouragement to seize the hope set before her. Because God's word is true, and it's impossible for him to lie, we have all, we have all the confidence in the world to take heart and to trust God's promises, just as Abraham did. So church, the faithfulness of God and the certainty of his promises aren't theoretical positions, propositions. They are unchangeable realities. Like Abraham, we can stake our, our lives on God's promises because God is the one who has promised them. Our God is a promise-keeping God. Now, the other aspect of this is by mentioning the, fra the phrase fled for refuge in the last part of verse 18, the author is using it to refer also to the Old Testament cities of refuge that are described in Numbers chapter 35, verse 9, and Joshua chapter 20. Now, in those passages, God appointed six cities, three on each side of the Jordan, into which man can flee when he has accidentally killed somebody. That person would be allowed to stay in that city of refuge without, without repercussion while the elders of the city investigated the case. Now, if they determined that it was indeed manslaughter and not murder, they would permit the man to, to live in that city until the death of the high priest. Now, after this, after that high priest died, then he could go back to his home in that town that he orig was originally from. And the members of the slain family, the slain man's family, they still couldn't get him back or, or avenge uh, what uh, had been done to that family member. Well, similarly, as believers, we can run to Jesus Christ, our eternal refuge. Both Jesus and the city of refuge are within easy reach of the person in need. The place of refuge is of no use if it can't be reached. Both Jesus and the city of refuge are open to all, not just the Israelite. No one who comes to the place of refuge is turned away in a time of need. Both Jesus and the cities of refuge were places to live. In time of need, one never came to a city 
a refuge just to look around, just to be an observer, a tourist. Both Jesus and the cities of refuge are, on, are the only alternative for the one in need. Without this refuge, destruction is certain. Both Jesus and the cities of refuge provide protection only within their boundaries. To go outside the provided refuge meant death. Both Jesus and the cities of refuge provided full freedom with the death of the high priest. But as our high priest, Jesus will never die. And as a result, we have eternal salvation. And so what this means is that no one, no avenger can touch us. Ever, ever, ever touch us. Why? Because he has already died and has arisen from the dead. And so he lives forever. And so we have a priest forever. A high priest forever. Now, the other thing I also wanted to share with you in verse 18 is, is the word that we see in our, in our translation here, the word encouragement. In the New King James ver- Version, and maybe in some other translation, the word consolation is used and said. And essentially, the, those words are pretty much the, the same mean the same thing. Now, the reason I mentioned this is to tell you that God isn't content to give us mere consolation. He wants to give us great consolation. Spurgeon, G.H. Spurgeon, described some characteristics of strong consolation. Strong consolation doesn't depend upon bodily health. Strong consolation doesn't depend upon the excitement of public services and Christian fellowship. Strong consolation can't be shaken by human reasoning. Strong consolation is stronger than our guilty conscience. And then he added this. It is a strong consolation that can deal with outward trials when a man has poverty staring, at, staring him in the face and hears his little children crying for bread, when bankruptcy is likely to come upon him through unavoidable losses, when the poor man has just lost his wife and his dear children have, put, have been put into some grave, when one after another all earthly, all earthly props and comforts have given way, it, in, it needs a strong consolation then, not in your picture trials, but in your real trials, not in your imaginary whims of afflictions, but in the real afflictions and the blustering storms of life. To rejoice then and say, through these things, be not with me as I would have them, yet hath he made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. This is strong consolation. Well, the last argument, right? Yeah, the third one. The last argument the author makes for certain salvation of true believers is in the last two verses of chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, and that is God's Son. In verse 19, the author poignantly reminds his people of their need for an anchor for the soul. Now, imagine that you're a boat, and the trials and temptations of this world are a massive storm. 
without a steady anchor, once that storm arrives, if you don't have that strong, a strong anchor, the storm is going to just throw you all over the place. You're going to get battered. Let me tell you, church, as a believer, you have a strong and immovable anchor that will stabilize your souls amidst the waves and storms of this world. And that anchor, my friend, is the hope in Christ. However, the spiritual anchor is different from material anchors, those material anchors on, on ships. For one thing, we're anchored, anchored upward to heaven, not downward. Meaning we're anchored not to stand still, but to move ahead. Well, our anchor is firm, cannot break, and is secure, meaning it cannot slip. And guess what? There's no earthly anchor at all that can give that kind of security. God's promise and oath anchor the hope that enters the inner, secure, the inner sanctuary behind the curtain that is the most holy place. And I know I mentioned it in a previous study, but here again, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest went into the most holy and offered the blood of an animal to turn God's wrath away from Israel. Well, that's what Jesus did, but in a greater sense. He entered the inner place behind the curtain, and instead of offering the blood of an animal, he offered his own blood on our behalf. And so our anchor, Jesus, has gone now before us as our forerunner to accomplish all that God's justice required. And so as our great high priest, Jesus, our Lord, has done two things here on our behalf. He has purchased our salvation and, ass and assured us of the promises of God. And two, he's now gone to heaven as our forerunner so that one day we will follow. Now, Dr. H.A. Uh, Ironside has suggested that the two phrases within the, uh, within the veil here in verse 19 and outside the camp, which we'll see in, when we get to chapter 13, verse 13, it basically summarizes the letter here to the Hebrews. And the way he puts it is that Jesus Christ is behind the veil as your high priest. He is behind the curtain as your high priest. And so therefore you can come boldly to his throne and receive all the help that you need. But here's the thing, you can't be a secret saint. In case you didn't hear me correctly, I said you can't, you mustn't be a secret saint. You must be willing to identify with Christ in his rejection and go outside the camp bearing his disgrace. And sadly, that's what often happens when believers are tempted to compromise their faith so that they won't be ridiculed. But here's the thing. If you live behind the curtain, you won't have any trouble going outside the camp. If you live behind the curtain where the Holy of Holies is, where the throne of Jesus is, where he is at it as, a, as high priest, you won't have any problems, you won't have any, any issues going outside the camp, where it's the most dirtiest and disgusting, where 
It's just all the heathens are and all the, you know, just everything imaginable, all the horrible stuff is, it'll be a lot easier. You won't be tempted to be like, uh, I don't want people to make fun of me because I'm a Christian. And so that's why I'm, you know, I'm just not going to say anything or I'm going to, you know, someone makes a joke about Jesus, a disparaging joke about Jesus. I'm just going to be like, I'm just going to laugh it off so that they won't, you know, tell me or ask me why I'm not laughing. But if you're truly a born-again believer, if you're living behind the curtain, any disparaging comment about Jesus, it's going to affect you. It's going to, it would be just as if someone was talking about your mom, your dad, or your child, someone that you really care about. Now, again, you're not going to, you're not going to want to fight, obviously, you know, but it's going to affect you. You're not going to see it as funny. You're going to be, you probably want to say something. I know I've seen stuff on, even online where people are making some very disparaging comments about Jesus. I'm like, you're talking about things you have no idea about. You don't even know what you're talking about. You think you know. But you have no idea. And how could you be talking about somebody you don't even know? That's People do that. But if they really knew who Jesus was, if they really knew who God was, the creator of the universe, if they knew what Jesus actually suffered for them, you wouldn't be making, and nobody would be making fun of them. So again... My point being here is that when, you're, when you live behind the curtain, you won't have, or behind the veil, you won't have any trouble going outside the camp. So and then lastly, at the end of verse 20, it ends by saying there, because he has become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And this again is where he comes back full circle, and what we'll see next time we get into Hebrews is that he gets back into the topic of Melchizedek and Jesus as high, as, as high priest. Now, also you've heard me mention this before, but for the Jew, he may say something like, reading this, he may say something like, wait a minute. You're saying Jesus broke through the veil that leads the way for the rest of us? Well, it's a problem. Only the high priest could go behind the veil. Only those of the tribe of Levi could be priests. And only direct descendants of the first high priest, Aaron, could be high priests. If Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, how could he be the forerunner into the Holy of Holies, if he wasn't even a Levite? Well, to answer this objection, the writer reaches back 2,000 years and pulls out the story of Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? He's quite an important figure. For according to <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 5, verse 10, one's understanding of Melchizedek is an indication of how well-versed one is in the Bible, in, in Bible doctrine. You see, a chapter and a half earlier, the writer said that he wanted to explain Melchizedek, his ministry, but he couldn't. Do you remember why? Because they weren't mature enough. He knew that they wouldn't get it. He knew that it just would go over their head. But here, and on to the next chapter, he raises the subject of Melchizedek anyways, almost as if he just couldn't resist. It's like, I need to get back onto this. You may not get it. Some of you may not get it, but I know some of you will. And so, as we'll see next time we get here, he gets back into that subject. And again, this is important to understand and to know this next part in chapter 7 <clears throat> is important to know, to understand 
in your mature, as you mature, if you want to mature as a, as a believer. Now, there are many things that we can learn from, this, from these verses and that we can take from, that we can apply into our lives. But I wanted to pull out one, one in particular, one topic in particular in this passage that um, I wanted to touch on. And I, I wanted to touch on it because for maybe for many of us, it's, it's hard to do. It's difficult. And it's a challenge of being in God's waiting room. It's a challenge of being in God's waiting room. I've been in waiting rooms where my appointment is at a set time, and I don't get seen for an hour and a half, two hours, and it's frustrating. I'm sure many of you have been in a similar situation where you just want to complain to the a, a person at the front desk. You're like, what, what the heck? Oh, the doctor's busy. We're backed up. We're short-staffed. And you would prefer to leave, but you know that appointment is important. And getting another would just take forever. Well, again, the passage here touches on the challenge of being in God's waiting room. Patience is one of the most difficult Christian virtues to grasp in this hurry-up society, in this hurry-up world where everything must be done right now, right away. Everything must be instant. Yet, after waiting patiently, it says, Abraham received what was promised. But he had to wait. He had to wait. Again, we live in an instant credit, everything now economy. We eat at water and mix foods or drive by fast food outlets, which poke our palates with immediate delicacies ranging from burgers and burritos to fried chicken and fried, chip, fried uh, chips or fish and chips. All of this, all of this, this world of right away, let's have it right now, it trains us to want, uh, to want what we want right now on the basis of something that requires little or nothing of us. We don't grow trees in our, on our yards. We buy them potted and several years advance in their growth or move to another house where they've already grown. Waiting isn't in style and patience has never been the forte of the flesh. If God weren't growing sons and daughters, things wouldn't take nearly as long. But since he's more interested in our growth than he is in our getting, waiting becomes a very essential and useful means towards an end. See, God doesn't traffic and add water and mix saints. God has a purpose for putting you in that waiting room. Keep in mind, Abraham had to wait two and a half decades to see the birth of his promised son. You and I must often wait for God's help in matters related to family, finances, health, or the direction of, uh, for the future. A seemingly protracted pause in God's manifest activity on our behalf must especially be difficult for those undergoing persecution for the faith. But yet, God is at work he works character in you and me. 
even when sometimes, especially when we cannot see him at work in our circumstances. If no word or help and hope exist, existed, we might give way to despair. Yet the promises of God help us to see future realities and draw encouragement from, from them. We only experience such encouragement. We only grow in this dimension of Christian faith as we sit in the waiting room. It can be a habitation of tension, frustration, and anxiety. But it, it can also be a place of unique peace and a work in which the Holy the Spirit is deepened. Our posture toward God during times of waiting can make the difference in the effect of such, of such an experience on us. Again, let me refer back to Spurgeon, what he said. He wrote this. Waiting is one of, the, one of the postures which a Christian soldier learns not without years of teaching. Marching and the quick marching are much easier to God's warriors than standing still. There are hours of perplexity when the most willing spirit anxiously desires to serve the Lord knows not what part to take. Then what shall we do? Vex, us, vex itself in despair? Fly back in cowardice? Turn to the right hand in fear? Or rush forward in presumption? No, but simply wait. Wait in prayer, however. Call, in, call upon God and spread the case before him. Tell him your difficulty and plead his promise of aid. But wait in faith. Express your unstaggering confidence in him for, uh, for unfaithful, untrusting waiting. Is it but an un... It, uh, for, let me repeat that. Express your unstaggering confidence in him for unfaithful, untrusting waiting is but an insult to the Lord. Believe that if he keep you tarrying even till midnight, yet he will come at the right time. The vision shall come and shall not tarry. Wait in quiet patience, not rebelling because you are under the affliction, but blessing your God for it. Never murmur against the second cause as the children of Israel did against Moses. Never wish you could go back to the world again, but accept the case as it is and put it as it stands simply and with your whole heart without any self-will into the hand of your, covenant, of your covenant God saying, now Lord, not my will, but thine be done. I know not what to do. I am brought to my extremities, but I will wait until thou shalt cleave the floods or drag, drive back my foes, I will wait if thou keep me many a day, for my heart is fixed upon thee alone, <coughs> O God, and my spirit waiteth for thee in full conviction that thou, wilt, that thou wilt yet be my joy and my salvation, my refuge and my strong tower. These words that Spurgeon wrote, they do, they reflect the spirit of Psalm chapter 33, verse 20 and 22. And this is a good uh, psalm or verses to, to read when you are in God's waiting room. And there it says, those two verses in Psalm 33 say, we wait for the Lord. He is our help and shield. For our hearts rejoice in him because we, trust solely, because we trust in his holy name. May your faithful love rest on us, Lord. For we put 
our hope in you. All right. Now, up until this point, the main lesson that we need to take hold on as believers or that we must take hold, hold on is that as believers, we must go on to maturity. And God has made it possible for us to do so. If you start to drift from the word, then you will also start to doubt the word. Before long, you will get dull towards the word and become lazy believers. And so the best way to keep from drifting, the best way to keep from falling away, the best way to keep from or to keep your eyes on the Lord and on Jesus and not on the world or on other things is to lay hold of the anchor. Be anchored heavenward. By being anchored heavenward, by being anchored in, on Jesus, you will be secure. You will find security. You will find that assurance. You will find that peace. <clears throat> if you haven't found it, if you've tried to do that and you haven't found it, then there's something you're still holding on to. There's something that you're still having given up to the Lord. Yes, Lord, I trust you, but what about this and, and that? And I got a plan for, I got to make a plan B. I got to hope for the best and expect the worst. When you're anchored on Jesus, as hard as it may be, you're always hoping for the best. And you know, regardless if the outcome is good or bad, there's a reason and purpose behind it. He wants to teach you something. He wants to give you something. He wants to make you more like Jesus. So don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged when you are waiting. And while you're waiting, you know, you are feeling the heat. You are feeling persecution. You are feeling anxious. When God calls your number, when God calls your name, man, it's the best feeling ever. Have you anchored yourself on Jesus? Have, is he your anchor? Are you holding on to the promises? Do you trust in the reliability of God's promises? If you answer no to any of those, to all those questions. Paul, you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. And so I want to take this opportunity now to invite you to the cross. And lay your sins there before him. Before Jesus. I want to invite you to the cross so that he can forgive you of all your sins. And make you his child, a born again believer. If you're ready and you want to surrender your life, you want to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, I want to lead you in a prayer to do that. So, with all your heart, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I want you to pray this. With the as if you were, as if were, if you if it was right in front of you, as if Jesus was standing right in front of you. I want you to pray this, Lord Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me. I now believe that you, you died 
for my sins. And three days later, you rose from the dead. So now I repent of those sins. I turn away from them. And I confess you now as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for taking the punishment I deserved. Thank you for saving me. Now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and instruct me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you sincerely pray that welcome to the family of God, you're now my spiritual brother and sister. I encourage you to get into the word. Find someone that will help you. Find a church that will teach you the word of God, the word of God properly without um, any of the hype. I just will teach you simply the word of God. If you need help with that, let us know. We'll help you find a church wherever you're at. If you're here locally, you can come here. There's several other churches here locally where I can um, refer you to as well. But um, if you're here in the Northeast, we're on Gateway South and Hondo Pass. Again, welcome to the family of God. And angels up in, in heaven right now celebrating that another sinner has come to be born again. I want to thank you again for joining us this week. Um, next week, we'll be celebrating Palm Sunday, and the week after that will be our Easter Sunday service. So hopefully you can join us again online, or you know, if you're nearby, you're welcome to come and hang out with us here. Um, well, until next week, again, thank you for joining us. We love you. Have a great week. Be blessed. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.